2nd Corinthians chapter number 9 if you will we're gonna do a part two this morning of uh, how much money should I give God and then we'll do a part three one more time when I come back from uh, California meeting but uh, this morning 2nd Corinthians 9 verse number six seven and eight we're just gonna come back in here and look at some things um, that I don't I I, I don't want to overlook I, I want to press on your heart um, verse 6 he says but this I say, he which soweth sparingly shall reap also sparingly, and he which sow bountifully shall reap also bountifully. Every man according as he purposed in his heart, so let him give, not grudgingly or of necessity, for God loveth a cheerful giver. And God is able to make all grace abound toward you, that ye always having all sufficiency in all things may abound to every good work. Notice it's not in every good work, it's what? to every good work. And last week we talked about the, the issue in giving and the issue that really is number one is the motivation and, and having the proper motivation about giving and, and the proper heart attitude about giving. And, and, and under Israel's program and the tithe and the offering, the motivation was fear. Do it or else, <laughs> if you will. But under in grace, the grace motivation isn't that at all because we've gotten everything. We, we've, you know, we, ha we are blessed with all spiritual blessings. What is the one blessing that, we're, that we lack? None. We have it all. But what's the one blessing that we're still waiting to, to enjoy? The new body. We have it, folks. It's given to us. We don't lack it, but what are we waiting for? To enjoy it, to experience it. See, you can experience, um, there's like 30, we were sang that song a minute ago, Count Your Blessings. There's 33 of them, or 34 blessings that you have. I, don't, I know you see the, the Christmas tree with all the things that you have in Christ, or 100 things you have in Christ, or, you know, that you see on the internet and everything. But really, those 100 things if you if you really read them, they start to restate things that they stated earlier, okay? But when you when you go back and you look at the main categories, there's really about 33 to 35 categories of blessings that you have. Now you can begin to divide them out and subsection them down and everything, and that's okay. But the issue is, is when you count those blessings, what's the one blessing that we can't experience yet? The new body. We can experience, we can live our lives and everything that we are. Now, the grace motivation is to say what? Thank you. And, and the issue in giving and, and, and the, the, the issue, the very first thing to understand when you talk about money and you talk about finances and you talk about giving is that issue of motivation, that proper attitude that we're to have in our giving. Here in verse 7, he says, Every man according as he purposed in his heart, so let him give, not grudgingly or of necessity. For God loveth a what kind of a giver? A cheerful giver, a happy giver, a happy hour. Man, it's happy hour. It, it's, a, it's an exciting time. And we're to give, and we're to give according to that. The next thing then in giving, you, you, got, the motiv you got the proper motivation and before you can ever talk about the amount that you're to be giving, you're to talk about, you're to have the right motivation. So now we're going to spend about two minutes on the amount, okay? In, in Deuteronomy, you go back into the law in Leviticus and Deuteronomy, and, and Israel had a 10% tithe system. You understand that. I don't believe we need to run the verses and look at that. But if you need them, you go to Deuteronomy 14, Deuteronomy 15, Deuteronomy 12, Leviticus 20. You just, there, it's there. And, and, and ultimately, and again, it ends up running out to be about 20, oh, about a 23.3 percentage that they were to be giving. They were to tithe on the gross and the net. And in every third to fifth, and every third year, or fifth, seventh year, they give it all back, and they do this, and they do that, and you, you know, you multiply by twelve and divide by a hundred, and boom, you got the number, okay? But so their amount in, in Israel's program was that tithe. What was the amount of their giving in the kingdom program? Jesus told them to sell what? All, hundred percent. Woo! So you can go from ten to a hundred. Figure it out. Where would you like to be? 
I like to be in the grace amount. Because the grace amount, there is no grace, there is no amount. In grace, the amount of your given is not specified by Paul. If you'll notice in verse number 7, Every man according as he purposed in his heart, so let him give, not grudgingly or of necessity, for, for God loveth a cheerful giver. You see, folks, it's not my job to tell you how much you're to give. What does the verse say? As he's what? Purposed. Every spending decision you make in your life is a spiritual decision. And it reflects your heart and where your hearts lie. The amount that you're, you give willingly is the issue in grace. The motivation, hey, I'm blessed with everything. If I, he died because all were dead. He died for us, why? So that we can go and do what? Live for him. The motivation, grace motivation uh, come back over to Romans 15. Just hold on to Corinthians. We're coming right back to it. First uh, Romans 15, to give you that principle again, just so you see it here. The grace motivation issue. <clears throat> Romans uh, 15, uh, verse 25, Paul says, But now I go into Jerusalem to minister unto the saints. For it hath pleased them of Macedonia and Achaia to make a certain contribution for the poor saints, which are at Jerusalem. It hath pleased them, verily. The folks there at Macedonia and Achaia, they understood something. They understood that there were some poor people down there in Jerusalem who were saints of the Most High God. But they were poor because they were in obedience to the program that God had for them. And now he, said, he goes on, he says, verse 27, For if the Gentiles have been made partakers of their spiritual things, their, what's that next word? Their duty. They got a duty to do something here. Their duty is also to minister unto them in carnal things. Why do they have a duty? Because they were in obedience to the word of God. And what did God do? He changed the program on them. Their, their poorness, their, their lack of funding wasn't due to their own stupidity. It was due to their obedience to the word of God to them. And the Macedonians and the K... Go back there to 2 Corinthians... In chapter 8, what did they do? 2 Corinthians 8, he, they come in. This is the same group there in verse 1, the end of that verse, churches of Macedonia. Here they are. What did they do? Verse number 5, And this they did, not as we hoped, but first gave their own selves to the Lord and unto us by the will of God. What did they do? Man, they sat there and they said, Man, our, look at what Israel has lost in the postponement of their program. These people are hurting. We have a duty to go and help them in their carnal things because, because spiritually what had happened to them? What's the next thing on the timeline for them? Here comes the kingdom. And it's, they understood what was going on. But who did they first give themselves to in that verse? The Lord. So in chapter 9, the amount that you give willingly, you purpose you sit down and you say, this is what we're going to do. Is the demonstration of your value and love for Christ. Is the way that you appreciate Christ. Is the way that you demonstrate how important He is in your life. Okay? Now, I know that may sound a little harsh but because we all appreciate Him. But how do you demonstrate it? People are always saying, Rick, how do, what are good works? How about giving? That's a good work. See, in Romans 12, there's a list of gifts that were given. One of the gifts is the gift of giving. Nobody wants that one. They don't. They want the tongues. They want, all, they want the stuff that puts them up here so people can see them. But there is a gift of helps, and there's a gift of giving. Why? Because in giving, what does it do? It comes and it hits you right at... Every decision financially you make is a spiritual one. And it reflects your heart. Because what, where you spend your money is where things mean to, the most to you. I have three kids. All three are in college. Emily will get there in a couple months. It ain't cheap. Now, we, we're going the cheap route. 
but it is not cheap. You're, but what do I do as dad? Well, we work, we get the job done, we figure it out, we get scholarships, I hope. It better be, <laughs> you know. My, my oldest wanted to go, at one point in time, wanted to go back east to a school that was 60K a year. I told her on somebody else's dime, baby, because I don't got that kind of scratch, you know. She isn't going there. She's going down the street for far less a year. But what do you do? Where, where does the value add in that? You may have your opinions about college. I've done research on the college thing, and I tell you what, right now you get payback on your college education far more than you ever did. It's amazing how the, the financial return on it is. Depending on, obviously, if you're going to be a basket weaver, good luck, okay? But when you get into specific fields in certain areas, there's, there's major return on your money. So what do you do? That's a big financial commitment, isn't it? You sit down, you research it, you figure it out, you go here, you go there. She gets accepted in both schools, but which one can we afford? The, the end game return bottom line are equal. Well, we're not going the 60K route, honey. We're going the, the 12K route. End game's the same. What do you, you sit and you figure that out. Now, what has that done for, to my, our family? I'm using me. Our family now for the ministry. What does that do? Now, we can't go and support and do something over here. Why? Because our finances, our resources are tied up here. Is any of it bad? No. It's not a bad thing at all to have them. What do you have to do? What does the verse 7 say? Purposed in his heart. You sit down, you look at it, and you figure it out. So in the, the amount of giving, Paul doesn't say, Paul says what? Purpose it. Sit down. What's important to you? If having a 401k that's not a 201k anymore, but rather it's a 1,001k because it blew up, if that's what's important to you, then what are you going to do? You're not going to be giving over here. You're going to be giving that way, aren't you? Your money demonstrates that. Come over with me to 1 Timothy 6. My point is, is in the, the amount. Motivation, by the way, will drive the amount. If your motivation is to retire at 50 <clears throat> or 45, that's me. That's next, this year. April, I'll be 45. I'm retiring. <coughs> As my wife just gives me that old, it ain't going to happen look. We're on a five-year plan, get the kids through college, and we're both retiring and moving to Jamaica. I don't know. No, not at all. I don't want to, huh? I don't want to go down there? Okay. No, but what's, what's your plans? You know what your plans are. Folks that are retired, you've, you've got it easy. You're retired. Some of us are sitting in here, well, maybe don't have it easy as in that, but some of us sitting in here are working. What's your plans? Have you thought about it? Sit down and think this through. Hey, what's the goal here? Where are we going? Because, folks, if you die, do you take any of it with you? You could be that old lady that dies and leaves billions and billions of dollars to her cat. Right? Or her dog, or whatever. What good did it do for you? See, that's the issue in motivation and the amount. I'm not talking about go out here and live like a pauper. I'm talking about what you've got, what you're doing. Plan this thing. Think about this. Pay attention to it. You've got the right motivation. Hey, he died for me. I'm going to go live for him. That's the only right. That's the only motivation. The love of Christ constrains us because we thus judge. We think this way. He died for me. So how how selfish is it for me to live any other way? First Timothy six, Paul, verse number nine. You know the the, the verses here. Starting verse six, but godliness with contentment is. What? Ooh, look at it. Godliness with what? Notice it's not godliness by itself, but it's godliness with contentment. By that verse, you ought to have written Philippians 4, verse 11, where Paul says, I have therefore learned in whatever state I am to be what? Content. 
What is contentment? Paul goes on in, in Philippians 4 and says, Man, whether I've been loaded or whether I've been poor, I, it's all right with me because who do I have? I have Christ. Now, that's RJ's version. Right? Godliness with contentment is what? Great gain. Because as I look at my life and as we begin to plan and to do and to figure out, what am I able to do with under grace? I'm able to purpose in my own heart. I'm able to make my own. Verse number 7, he goes on, For we brought nothing into this world, and it is certain we can carry nothing out. Some of you will try. I tell you, if the Lord come back today and, and the trump blows, he's going to have to blow it eight or nine times to get you out of this world. You're so stuck down into it. Yank you twice, if not three. Hey, folks, you're not taking any of it home. Notice where the, your contentment is to lie in the next verse. And having food and raiment, let us be there with what? Content. Notice it doesn't say the big hill, the big house on the hill. Notice it doesn't say any of that. It says what? The very basic, why? Because we thus judge that if he died for all, then man, why in the world can't we live for him? I'm not talking about, and Paul isn't talking about being destitute now on the street corner. He's talking about having a what? An, an attitude and a thinking process about this. Verse 9, but they that will be rich. Now you've got to notice these verses very carefully. But they that, what's that word? Will, that is a heart attitude. That I'm going to be what? Rich. So I play the Powerball every week. Powerball is $2 a game now, isn't it? Something like that. 52 weeks out of the year. What's that, $104? But you can't play once. You've got to play every drawing. Don't you? And you can't play one ticket. Now you've got to play five. Can't play five. Now, by the way, I saw the billboard coming in. It's like 420-something million. So now we're playing 20 bucks a pop. That only gets you 10 tickets. Now I'm in at it at work, getting to my other 200. Yeah, all of a sudden, you spent more money trying to play a goofy game you'll never win in your lifetime. If you do, by the way, remember the poor <laughs> preacher. Okay? Okay? All right? Yeah. Exactly. I have purp yeah, purpose it in your heart. Yeah. But what's the point, folks? The point is, is, do you know that the average guy who wins the lottery is broke in f within five years? I'd like to try. <laughs> I really would. Okay. What's the point? The point is, is the, though they that will be rich, what? Fall into temptation. I tell you what, if you had it on easy street, you wouldn't be here this morning. You know how I know that? It's going to be 85 degrees outside today, sun shining, beautiful day. You would be up in the mountains playing to your heart's content. You know why I know that? That verse right there just told me it would be. You would be. You'd be out riding, what do you guys got, Qu uh, razors, quads? I used to have one. I had to sell it. I broke my heart. You know, you would be. Hey, f fun. Not nothing wrong with being fun, but what's, what's got your attention all of a sudden? They that, what, will be rich. They fall into temptation, which while some coveted after, that they have erred from the faith and pierced themselves through with many sorrows. But thou, O man of God, flee these things. Oh, I'm sorry, I missed the wrong verse, didn't I? Yeah, verse 9 I was in verse 10, but I skipped the best one. And a, uh, fall into temptation, verse 9, in a snare and into many foolish and hurtful lusts, which drown men in destruction and perdition. For the love of money is the root of all evil, which while some covet after, they have erred from the faith and pierced themselves through with many sorrows. There you go. The, the, but it's, it's not money, it's the what? The love of money. Why? Because I have purpose in my heart to do what? I purpose in my heart to be rich. The attitude. The amount is a, is, is, is a, is a non-issue. 
the love of it, the root of all evil is what? The love, the, the lust, the I got to have. So when you come to talk about giving, grace giving, how much money should I give God? The amount isn't the issue if, as long as you have the proper attitude about it. Again, there's some of you in the room, like I said, I, you know, I was thinking about that. I said that last week. I don't look at how what, you guys, what everybody gives just because I don't. And we have men who take care of that except for one time a year when I hand out the, the, the statements. And everybody goes, well, you shouldn't know how. You know, Paul knew how much people were giving him. You know that? Paul didn't have a secretary or a treasury keeping track of it. He knew. He knew because who's he scolding here? The Corinthians. The Corinthians were very wealthy people. And they weren't giving. That's when he gets back in in 1 Corinthians 8 about the equality. And there's to be an equity in it. And though the Macedonians, poor people, were given and begging to take you rich guys who could afford, were given nothing. So he knew how much people were sending to him. He wasn't oblivious to it. And, and I, I say that because I'm not oblivious to what happens here. I just don't concentrate on it. Okay? The amount. Now, you're in 1 Timothy, right? Go back to chapter 5. There are three reasons to make money in Scripture. And I want to look at these just real quickly and move on because in the giving issue, there is a reward in the giving. But I want to point these out. There's three reasons why, you're, why you make money in Scripture. Outside of these three, there is no other scriptural reason to make money. Okay? The first one is in chapter 5, verse number 8 of 1 Timothy. But if any provide not for his own, especially for those of his own house, he hath denied the faith and is worse than an infidel. The, one of the number one reasons to make money and to work a job and to, and to strive and to toil is to take care of his own house. And if you don't do that, you're worse than an infidel. You've lost the faith. And if you have paid any attention to the news outlets at all, you know what an infidel is. <laughs> That's us, by the way, according to them. But you're worse than that. You've what? Denied the faith. So the number one issue in making money is to provide for your family. The second two are found in Ephesians chapter number 4. Ephesians chapter 4. I know what everybody does when you talk about money. You go back to Proverbs and you run those verses in Proverbs. The problem with Proverbs is Proverbs belongs to Israel. And Proverbs belongs to their heart and the and the the heart of the little flock as they're going through the tribulation and as they're working through the, 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 to the kingdom, and they have a heart issue, and those heart issues are what? Man, he gave us everything. How selfish is it of us to live for nobody but him? Sounds similar, doesn't it? Ephesians chapter 4, here's the second two issues. Ephesians 4, verse 28. Let him that stole steal no more, but rather let him labor working with his hands the thing which is good, that he may have to give to him that needeth. The second issue in making money is let him work. Work with your hands, labor, toil. Why? Keeps you out of trouble, doesn't it? Keeps you out of mischief. Keeps you out of, keeps you on. Let him that stole steal no more. You know how you unemploy a thief? Give him a job. You work. Why? Second point there, that he may what? Give to, that he may have to do what? To give to him that needeth. The second point out in, in the issue of making money is so that you can help other people. But think about this. If you're working a job and you're so strapped in your own finances that you can't help someone else, you're, you're what? There's something off balance here, isn't there? So if in your personal financial home, now, and I'd say this because, folks, you understand, I have a mortgage, I've got bills, I'm not talking out of turn like I don't have any of this. But if you've got this in order, what then can you do? 
You can reach over here and do what? Help somebody else. Okay? Now the third point, and the third reason, is that issue of supporting the work of the ministry. So three reasons. One, provide for your own family. Two, have the ability to help others also. And third, it's to support the work of the ministry. And when you begin to support the work of the ministry, that's where you begin, you're in Ephesians, flip back to Philippians. I'll give you an illustration of this. Philippians 4. When you begin to support the work of, of, of the ministry, you begin to deal with and you begin to get into the reward that's associated with grace giving. Philippians 4, Paul says in verse 15, Now ye Philippians know also that in the beginning of the gospel, when I departed from Macedonia, no church communicated with me as concerning giving and receiving, but ye only. For even in Thessalonica ye sent once and again unto my necessity not because I desire a gift but I desire fruit that may abound to your account see that issue of abounding fruit abounding to your account they did what they supported Paul verse 18 but I have all and abound I am full having received of Epaphroditus the things which were sent unto you I'm sorry from you an odor of a sweet smell, a sacrifice acceptable, well-pleasing to who? He's talking about money, folks. And what did Paul say? You guys sent to me not once but twice when I was in Thessalonica, and you know what God did with that gift that you sent to me? He said, well done. And he, ab he applied it to your account as what? Fruit to your account. People say, well, Rick, what are good works? Giving is a good work. And giving is a good work that you can purpose in your heart and you can be cheerful about it and it accomplish something and it will then abound to you. It, it, will, begin to, to look, it will begin to add fruit to your account. And when you talk about the reward, we've talked about that. We talk about the reward of the inheritance. We talk about the heavenly places and the things that we do today as it has an impact out there in eternity. And giving is in the same issue and in the same vein. Again, the amount. By the way, how do you determine the amount? <laughs> how do you figure that out? Have you ever thought about that? Well, you... Set a plan up. 1 Corinthians chapter number 16, Paul talks to them about the collection of the offering. And, and he says, well, let's just go over there. 1 Corinthians 16. <clears throat> there are three basic ways to decide on the amount. Three reasons to make money. Why do you work? Provide for the family. Have the ability to help and support others who need help. Support the work. Three basic ways to decide on the amount. The first issue is you, you, you got a plan. 1 Corinthians 16, 1, Paul says, Now concerning the collection of the saints, as I have given order to the churches of Galatia, even so do ye upon the first day of the week. Notice that. First, uh, uh, let every one of you lay by him in store, as God has prospered him that there be no gathering when I come. You see what Paul had there? Paul had a plan. He told them, hey, look, first day of the week, you guys get this in order. Get a plan together. If, if you don't have a plan about when you're going to do it, you're probably going to give less. Make the plan to do. The second issue is the issue of, uh, of, the, uh, of, the issue of ability, able, proportionately. Some of us are in different income brackets, status, okay? You can't say, listen, I'm going to give a thousand bucks a month when your income is fifteen hundred. It ain't going to work. That's very, it's not wise, it's right, it's very foolish. Because what do you have to do? What's number one? Provide for your family, isn't it? 
right? So what do you do? You sit there with your family budget and you do what? You make a plan. You make a decision in it. And then you give, the third point is you give sacrificial, sac, sacrificially. You give it with that understanding of, well, maybe we don't eat out but once a week. Or maybe we don't eat out at all. So that not only do we meet the family budget, but then we go over and we can take care of the work of the ministry. And when you do, just as we were there in Philippians, there is a reward in that issue. And the reward, come back there to 2 Corinthians 9. Second Corinthians nine. Well, helps to get there. Second Corinthians chapter number nine. Again, folks, motivation got it down. The amount in grace. Grace will all. Grace says you. The law says you have to do it or else. Grace says, no, you do it because you want to do it. You do it because of that gift principle. By the way, folks, grace will always do more for you than the law. And if you live under the law requirements, you're going to live in a a manner that's unworthy of who you are in Christ. Because it's just going to put a pressure on you. So what about it? Well, look at 2 Corinthians 9. Look at verse number 8. You come out of verse 7 about the Lord, uh, God loveth the cheerful giver. Verse 8, And God is able to make all grace abound toward you, that ye always having all sufficiency in all things may abound to every good work. Skip the parentheses and go to verse number 11 being enriched in everything to all, what? Bountifulness, which causes through us thanksgiving to God. Notice that verse, talking about the reward. We've talked about the motivation, the amount, you're on the hook for that. Now here's the reward of it. Notice this, all, all what? All bountifulness. That's the way we're to give. That's the measure of our giving. It's the bountifulness. Notice in verse 11, which causes, what's that next word? Through us, thanksgiving to God. The, the, the bountifulness, the, the giving, something's squeaking. <laughs> Look out, she's blowing. <laughs> the, the, the bountifulness, the, the, the giving. That's the way we're to give, the measure of our bountiness, the enriching, there in verse 11, being enriched in everything. We sang the song, count your what? Many blessings, count them. Look at, your, look at what you've been empowered, and you're rich. And, and that's where your giving comes out of. Ephesians 1, 3, we're blessed with all spiritual blessings where? In heavenly places, in Christ Jesus. We've, we've, by the way, we've already received the reward. It's there. Now we just get to go what? We've received the blessings. We get to go and do what? Participate in them. We get to go and we get to enjoy them. And when we think about, run that knob on that thing, honey. Just quit it blowing. When we think about giving, and the impact. What was the third point on why? Supporting the what? The ministry. The willingness to give money. That lies at the root of not only the motivation, the amount, but the reward. Look back at 2 Corinthians 8. Because I want you to pick up, we read this verse a minute ago, but I want you to pick up, are you guys with me? I'm trying to not be disconjointed, but I feel like I am. Look at verse 1. Moreover, brethren, we do you to wit of the grace of God 
bestowed on the churches of Macedonia. You see that, that issue about the grace of God bestowed on the churches of Macedonia? The grace of God. How that in great trial of affliction, the abundance of their joy and their deep poverty unto the riches of their, what? Liberality. The grace of God and that liberality... Verse 3, for to their power I bear record, yea, and beyond their power they were willing of themselves, praying us with much entreaty that we should receive the gift. Now watch, and take upon us the fellowship of the ministering to the saints. One, the first piece of that reward about grace giving is this issue and, and, pro, and providing for the work of the ministry is this fellowship in the uh, uh, of the ministering to the saints. And when you think about the Philippians here, the Macedonians, uh, uh, again, just real quick, come over with me to Philippians 1. Because they, there's some terminology here that's, that I want you to see that's associated with the, their issue of their giving. Philippians 1, uh, verse number 3, I thank my God upon every remembrance of you. Always in every prayer of mine for you all making request for your fellowship in the gospel from the first day until now. You see that fellowship in the gospel? What did he say in 2 Corinthians? Fellowship of the ministering to the saints. Fellowship of the gospel. Chapter 4 of Philippians. We read it just a minute ago. What did he do? He what did they do? Hey, you sent to me in Thessalonica not once but twice, and there's going to be fruit that abounds to your account because what were they doing? They were providing the measure and the means for what? The fellowshipping of the ministry of the saints to go, that work to, to flourish. That's what happens when you give to the local assembly here. Come back with me to 2 Corinthians 9. Because when you give, and I'm talking money-wise. Now, again, when you give, there are many different ways to give to a local assembly. We have the Steiners, they do the landscaping. That is their giving. Okay? They take care of the grounds. We have folks who give through taking care of the food pantry. That's their giving. Got it. That's, per, that's beautiful. It's per, that's what we're talking about. I'm talking last week, this week, about money specifically. There's other ways you give of your time and of your energy. I do that. Other people, the people who teach and to do, they give of their time and their energy. That's not discounting that. We're talking about money here. 2 Corinthians 9, this fellowship. Drop, drop, go back over and look at verse 12. 2 Corinthians 9, 12, the rest of the chapter here. For the administration of this service, what service? That enrichment, the bountifulness that causes through us thanksgiving, the, 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 the service of a cheerful giver, the service of someone who sat down and purposed, they set the plan, they've set the amount that, that, that won't put them in, 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 in violation of providing for themselves and their family or helping others. They've sat and they said, this is what we're going to do right here. That service for the administration of this service, the issue of giving, not only supplieth the want of the saints, but... It is abundant also by many thanksgiving unto God. Now let me ask you so, what is supplying the want of the saints? What do the saints want? What do you want? If you came here tonight and the doors were padded and the for sale sign out front, what would you want? You'd be calling me. Where are you going, Rick? Where are you? Where is Bible study? What does the saints what do the saints want? The 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 young lady in, in Wisconsin that we've been talking with and who's listening this morning, you know what she would love to have in her neighborhood? This fellowship, a church. What what for the administration of this service, the money given by the Corinthians and by the Macedonians and the Philippians and the body to Paul, what did he supply to the saints? Come on, folks, the teaching, the, the fellowship, the, the edu edification, the whole bit. That's what he's talking about here. 
but it abounded also by many thanksgivings unto God. Folks, when we're supplying the want of the saints, what are we doing? We're abounding to the what? Many thanksgivings to God. Whilst by experiment of this ministration, they glorify God for your professed subjection unto the gospel of Christ and for your liberal disp- uh, dis- distribution unto them and unto all men. And by their prayer for you, which long after you, the exceeding grace of God be in you. Thanks be unto God for His unspeakable gift. Folks, when we're doing what we're supposed to be doing as a local uh, assembly, as a local manifestation of the body of Christ, we're causing people to glorify God. We're, We're building up the saints. In verse 14, And by their prayer for you, which long after you, whoo, They want to be with you. You don't know how many times I get an email from someone through the website that says, hey, tell the people there, they're lucky to have you. Because we don't have anybody in our town. Please don't turn the internet off. Actually, I call her a young lady. I know she'll get a kick out of it. I'll get it. Okay? She's not. She's she's retired. Uh, Aged. Okay? I'll get there. But you know what you're, what we're talking about here? I get all the time. Don't, she's asked me, don't turn, the, don't turn the, the, uh, the live stream off. Whatever you do, don't stop it. Why? Because it's the way in. It's the way the plug in. Why? Because people are what? What do they want? What do the saints want? They want the fellowship. We have a young lady here in our midst. She's joining us now off and on, it seems like. One of her comments many years ago was, hey, it's good to be there live stream, but I miss the fellowship. It's better live and in person. That's what we're talking about. Giving produces fellowship in the gospel because we're able to come together. Paul Paul says something very wonderful, just heartwarming, Romans 12. Romans 12. Romans 12, verse, well, verse 15. Rejoice with them that do rejoice, and weep with them that what? Weep. Boy, we do that when we come together, don't we? We hear of one another's had a bad, uh, you know, something's come up in life, and we're able to weep with them if it's a sad day. And rejoice with them when it's a great day. Where do you get that from? You get it from within a local assembly. The second area of giving and supporting the work of the ministry is it produces an opportunity for personal growth in your life. And the idea that we, ha- that we have giving should never produce a need in life. Giving is to come here in the, in the local assembly is going to produce some need in your life, and I understand that, and it's called sacrifice. Come back to 2 Corinthians 9. You know, well, I think you're still there, maybe. I want you to look at verse number 8, kind of wrap all this up this morning. The reward of the giving in a local assembly, the reward of giving in your life, is, is, is that issue of that all bountifulness and that enrichment and that thanksgiving that flows through you. It's a result of having the right motivation and the proper thinking having, and, and, and having an understanding that the amount isn't the issue. The issue is what's going on inside of you. And the issue, you, you, you know, we talk about sacrifice. That's what he says there, uh, as, as a man purposed in his heart, so let him give. You've sat down and you said, this is what we're going to do. You know what we think sometimes about sacrifice is not having the extra TV in the other room. You know that? We think sometimes sacrifice isn't having that other car in the driveway. Keeping up with the Joneses or the Jordans. I have five cars in my driveway. It's called a used car lot. 
I can sell all of them under 2,000 bucks to you real quick, okay? <laughs> Except for one. You see, folks, grace giving is, is going to produce a capacity of personal growth in your life and an appreciation of the sufficiency that we have in God's grace. And I'll be honest with you, folks, you'll never appreciate the sufficiency of God's grace until you need it. And usually where we begin to need it is when things get rough, times get tough, you lose a job, your 401k becomes a 201k, or becomes a 0k. Then you begin to look. But you know what that helps you to do? It helps you to grow. 2 Corinthians 9, verse number 8 is probably one of the, one of the key verses that help me go through some, when, we, when our family, when we go through some tough times. Folks, I know what it is to have $10 in a bank account. I know what it is. And a stack of bills sitting there looking at you and the paycheck income until the end of the week. And it's peanut butter and jelly sandwiches and it's rice, uh, the, the crackers for the other piece of the meal. I understand what that is. I understand what it is to grow up and have nothing but macaroni and cheese to eat. That's why my dad will not eat macaroni and does not like pasta. Because we had enough spaghetti to create our own Italy. He won't. We underst I understand what that is. I understand what those is. So I'm not talking out of something I don't get. But if you look at verse number 8, notice something here. And God is what? Able. Never forget who's doing the work here. Because sometimes we think it's us. It's my paycheck. It's my, it's my checking account. It's my... No. God is what? Able to do what to you? Make all grace. All is all, isn't it? Abound towards you that ye always having all sufficiency. You lack nothing. Always having all sufficiency in all things may abound to every good work. Folks, you ought to think about that sufficiency. You ought to think about when he says there, God is able to make all grace abound to you that you always having all sufficiency. What did, Paul, what did he tell Paul in chapter 12? My grace is what? Sufficient. Where our wealth resides isn't in our checking account, folks, it's in who we are in Christ. You guys know the song, God Bless the USA, sung by the one dude. It says, though I lose it all, what do, I, what, do you, what do I still want? I want the country, I want the ability. Folks, if you lose it all, you've never lost it. You never have. You can go out here today, you can go up to your bank account, empty it out, spend all the money, win the Powerball, do every, whatever you want to do. When you die, you're going to leave it all behind, but when you die, what do you get promoted to? Glory. That's the, the prospect, the, the thinking process. In our society, we don't really suffer like others do around the world, but here's an area, the area of giving that you can suffer in, and finances. You can make a choice. You can do what 2 Corinthians 9, 7 says. You can sit. You can say, okay, we don't have an amount to give, and that's good because everybody in the room is different. Everybody in the room has... By, by the way, the, the tithe... I almost looked at it with you this morning, but when you talk about the tithe, if they obeyed the Word of God, what would be happening to them over here? They get the blessing. You're robbing God of tithes and offerings. Then he says to him in Malachi, Prove me, and I'll do what? I'll rain it down on your head so hard you won't have any way to keep it straight. Why? Because if they prove him by what? Obeying the word, then, then, then they would have the prosperity, wouldn't they? We don't have that today. And I'm glad we don't have it today, I'll be honest with you, because we struggle at just obeying the 13 books we have. And you can go and work, and you can provide, and you can do what work is meant to do. Provide for your family and help others, and then support the local ministry. And if you're working to climb the corporate ladder, you're working for the wrong reason. 
You're working for an anti-scriptural reason, I'll be honest with you. Because what does Scripture say? Provide, support others, support the work of the ministry. When you work, what kind of an attitude are you to have about work? Not as men pleasers, but as what? Pleasing, doing the will of God in Christ Jesus. See, you think about that. 2 Corinthians 9, verse 6, verse 7. Every man, according as he purposed in his heart, so let him give, not grudgingly, nor of necessity, for God loveth a cheerful giver. Folks, I'd hope that you'd be a cheerful giver. I would hope that you would sit, make a plan, that you would sit and look at what's going on in your family. If you if you got a family, most of you are in this are coupled up, married up. Some of you guys are young, you're not there yet. Don't get there. Some of you <laughs> got some things going on, some of you are starting to work jobs. Make a plan. I've done it with my kids. Sit down here, look, you're working a job, two of them are working. One's wanting to, she'll get there. Here's a plan. Let's okay, here's here's what monthly rent looks like. Here's what the bills look like. You're gonna make it. Here it is. Boom. By the way, here's what your car insurance looks like. Okay? Here's the bill. Get it planned down. Why? So that they'd understand that what they go work that job is, is to do what? Take care of that side of the ledger, but then also to come over here and take care of the other side. Purpose it. Set it down. You've got the right motivation. You, the, the amount can't be hanging over your head. If, by the way, if you need an amount, I'll give you one. I got one in mind, okay? But it isn't hanging over your head. And know that the reward of providing for the local ministry is to, is to then provide for what? What all saints want. Fellowship. Edification. And a continuation of the local assembly. Okay? Now, in part three, get you to come back in two weeks, we're going to look at where my money should be going. Okay? How much money should I be giving God? Well, where should my money go? Where should it be going? Okay? All right. Dearly Father, we thank you for the morning, Lord. We thank you for your word, for the instructions here. And Lord, I just pray that we would heed them. We would think about it, pray about it, Consider what the verses say. And then, Lord, make that sacrifice in our lifestyle, in our giving, in our, in our every details of life so that we can have a bountiful harvest and that fruit can be added to our account because we do it with the proper attitude and we do it with the proper thinking process. And we only get that from your word as it then lives in our lives and burns into us and we go and live out our days that way. And we'll give you the glory. In your name we pray.